Hello and welcome to the Just and Sinner podcast. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. Just a quick reminder that Just and Sinner as an organization is supported by donors. So if you have appreciated and uh, been able to benefit in any way from the things that we do, we would ask that you would consider becoming a contributor. You can go to justincenter.org, go to our donate page there. You can sign up on Patreon or a number of other uh, places where you uh, can give gifts uh, to support us and all the things that we do. So uh, on the program today, uh, we are going to be talking about something that I've been asked to talk about quite a bit. And that was a, that's an ecumenical dialogue that, um, that occurred between the uh, International Lutheran Council or representatives of the International Lutheran Council. And I will uh, explain who that is for those who maybe aren't familiar with, with inter-Lutheran things. Uh, and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity which is um, basically an ecumenical group that was established post-Vatican II uh, with, with the Roman Catholic Church who engages in dialogue with various various other traditions. Um, so what this is, it's a document that is the product of some dialogues that occurred over a couple years. And this was this was released, I believe, in 2020. So it was um, a couple years ago now um, that there were a series of findings. And there's basically just a report of some places of commonality that were found as well as ongoing differences between the Roman Catholic Church and and Lutherans. So as I've done a bit of dialogue with with Roman Catholicism, uh, I figured it would be something that would be useful to do to kind of delve into some of these issues that were discussed in these dialogues. Uh, These kind of ecumenical dialogues, I think, are really helpful. I'm a big supporter of these kinds of conversations. The kind of of dialogues that I don't think are helpful are ones that just kind of ignore differences or pretend that we all agree or act like differences don't matter. And I, I don't believe those kinds of things are helpful. I think a lot of the ecumenical movement of the 20th century tended to do that in various ways. And uh, I think it's it's less than helpful if you're just kind of pretending you agree or using language that you're really both interpreting in completely different ways. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I, I as you probably know, if you followed my work, I, I think it's really important to engage with other traditions and, and speak with Christians from various approaches to things. And um, we can, you know, strengthen each other, even as we challenge each other in various things. So I find this this kind of thing to be extremely helpful. I'd love to be part of these kinds of dialogues to some capacity in, in the future, if, if I'm ever able to do something like that. So uh, let's talk about who the International Lutheran Council is, first of all, for those who aren't familiar with the, the Lutheran world so much, or even if you are part of the Lutheran world, you may not know who the ILC is. Um, now, as we're talking about global Lutheranism, uh, we, we of course have various synods in the, that are specifically you know regional. So for example, the AALC, the American Association of Lutheran Churches, we are in the United States. I mean it's it's in our name. <laughs> um, or the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is you know named after Missouri, but it's not actually just in, in Missouri. Um, though the, like the like full name used to be Missouri, Ohio, and other states. Um, so it expanded beyond beyond just just Missouri. But um, you know if if you go to a church that is similar to the AALC or, or the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in say Canada, it's going to be part of the Lutheran Church of Canada most likely, uh, the or the the LCC. So what we have beyond just uh, national or regional church bodies is the, this broader federation of churches that work together in various ways that share a, uh, a common theology. Uh, and so with, within the branch of Lutheranism that I'm a part of in the AALC, we are part of the ILC, the International Lutheran Council. So the International Lutheran Council is comprised of a number of synods throughout the world. I mean, on all continents, we've got churches in you know Australia, Ethiopia, Kenya, all throughout South America, Canada. They're you know, obviously in Europe. So there are, are churches from all over the place that are part of the, of the International Lutheran Council. So we are churches that... Um, have a shared commitment to certain beliefs. We have a shared commitment to, specifically to being confessional Lutherans, that we um, believe that the Lutheran confessions of 1580 in the Book of Concord are a true and proper exposition of, of the Word of God. Uh, and we believe in the authority and inerrancy of, of Holy Scripture. So that that's the ILC. So the ILC would be the more conservative group of Lutherans throughout the world as compared to something like the 
Uh, the Lutheran World Federation, or the LWF, which the ELCA and various other church bodies throughout the world would be a part of. Um, there, there is also another uh, group of churches that uh, includes the, the Wisconsin Synod and some some others as well, which is smaller than than the the ILC would be. Uh, but that's the reason why this particular document is something that I, that I pay a lot of attention to, probably more so than something like the Joint Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification, which was something through the Lutheran World Federation. Um, and and I, at some point, I, you know, I've wanted to delve into the Joint Declaration as well in the history and look at the document itself at some point, which I haven't done. But, but the difference is, and this is an important difference, when you're looking at the Lutheran World Federation, there is not a a strict commitment to retaining the theology of the Lutheran Confessions necessarily. Um, so for those who are not familiar with Lutheran distinctions, um, there there's a difference between uh, two kinds of subscription to our confessions. So there is a quia subscription and there is a quatenus subscription. A quia subscription is, um, th this is a Latin word, um, meaning because. We, we believe in the teachings of the Lutheran confessions, what's in the Book of Concord, because those teachings are a reflection of what's taught in the Word of God, because it is consistent with Scripture. Um, this is distinguished from a quatenus subscription, which is insofar as, meaning that this affirmation of confessional subscription says we agree with the confessions insofar as they agree with the teachings of, of Holy Scripture. And so the Quatenu subscription is really more so the position of the Lutheran World Federation. And of course, there are plenty of differences within the Lutheran World Federation because it's very broad. Uh, but the ILC will take a stronger uh, Quia subscription. And, you know, as I always say, the problem with a Quatenu subscription is just that you can take a Quatenu subscription to nearly anything. Um, I, you know, I've said I could take a Quatenu subscription to the uh, the Book of Mormon, because I affirm everything in the Book of Mormon insofar as it is a reflection of what's taught in Holy Scripture. All right, well, it doesn't tell you much at all of, of the points of, of obvious disagreement there. So um, I hold to a quia subscription, a confessional Lutheran. Uh, and so oftentimes we use the words, the, the phrase confessional Lutheran to identify ourselves. So this is beyond just the, the broader Lutheran world, this is the part of the Lutheran world that I myself am a part of in terms of, of the confessional Lutheran world. So that's why this document is, um, you know, particularly interesting to, to me because it is the kind of Lutheranism that, that I represent and reflect and support and am uh, promoting in what I do. Okay. Um, so there's there's the brief of who the the ILC is for those of you who didn't really know who the ILC was. Now this largely is really uh, professors within the LCMS that were part of of this dialogue. Uh, there's nobody from the AA you'll see that was involved. Um, but let's see, uh, Thomas Winger, who's actually he's part of the Church, Lutheran Church of Canada, but uh, Albert Culver. Um, let's see who else was uh, was involved here. Uh, John Stevenson, actually, he's Lutheran Church Canada as well. So a lot of LCC representation there too. And Roland Ziegler, uh, who teaches at Concordia. Fort Wayne, uh, Bishop uh, Voigt of the of Selk, um, it, which is the Lutheran Church in Germany, the Confessing Lutheran Church in Germany. Um, he was part of this as well. So uh, I'm just going to kind of go through some of this and talk topic by topic what things were addressed. Now I'm not going to go through. There's a, if you, if you want to read the whole document, I'm not going to read the entire thing. Um, the the beginning is a preamble which basically defines what confess, confessional Lutheranism is. It talks about the various Lutheran confessions to lay out some some background here. I've got plenty of stuff on that if you want to see. I've got a, a lot of podcasts on what it, what the confessions are, going into the theology of our confessions. So if you want to see that, go elsewhere. But that's not really the, the meat of the stuff here. That's really preamble. Uh, th that's important, especially for Roman Catholics that are not familiar with with um, who the ILC is and uh, kind of where, where we're coming from theologically or in terms of our, our history. Um, but what I really want to focus on today is the topic of the Eucharist and the, specifically the Eucharist and, and sacrifice. So we're talking about the nature of, of the Mass. Now here is where I think there is some really positive, constructive dialogue that has occurred here. Uh, I'll make sure I put a link to the, this document in the video description on, on YouTube. Um, 
And yeah, if you're listening to the podcast, I guess you can go to the YouTube channel and just find a link. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, or you could just Google it. You could probably find the document, honestly, pretty pretty easily. So th this is the, the second topic that's addressed. We have the preamble. This is the Mass as Eucharistic Sacrificial Banquet. So we'll explore some of what's talked about there. So the, the major question, of course, here is the question of the Eucharist as sacrifice. Now, if you read through the Lutheran Confessions, there are some pretty harsh statements about the Roman Mass, particularly if you read the Smallcote articles. It, Luther calls it a blasphemy, and he's, he's extremely blunt about it. And we have to define what exactly is it that's blasphemous about the Mass, because we also have in the Apology of the Augs, well, in the Augsburg Confession and the Apology of the Augsburg Confession as well, statements that say that we uphold the Mass with its with greatest reverence. And Melanchthon explains bounds upon that quite beautifully within the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. So what does it mean that the Mass is this terrible blasphemy, but also we uphold the Mass with greatest reverence? So clearly there's something that's going on in the medieval church that we are rejecting as um, more than just a little problem, but there is something that we are also upholding and saying we, we are still observing the Mass. Uh -huh. so, so what about the Mass are we rejecting? What is it that we're uh, accepting? So that's what we're going we're gonna to get into. So um, here, there is there is a statement of agreement between the the Roman Catholic and the Lutheran churches on this issue of, in the ILC. So, by the way, this document also refers to the churches of the ILC as Concordia Lutherans. I don't know where that phrase came from. They didn't use the phrase confessional Lutherans, and I assume that there's, there's probably a reason for that. Um, perhaps they wanted to distinguish that from you know, confessional Lutherans within the Lutheran World Federation, or or maybe to distinguish that from those in the, say, the Wisconsin Synod and those groups. And I can't recall the name of their international group um, that they're a part of, but uh, perhaps that's the reason they didn't want to use the term confessional, but they're called Concordia Lutherans, which is a little odd because Concordia is just like the name of a bunch of LCMS schools. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and I know like the, the ILC is not just the LCMS. Uh, I know sometimes it can feel like that, but it, the ILC is not just the LCMS. Okay. Um, but nonetheless, you find the phrase Concordia Lutherans throughout for whatever reason. Uh, okay. So this, this says, this is the joint statement. Catholic and Lutheran Christians together recognize that in the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ is present. This is the quote, quote, is present as the crucified who died for our sins and rose again for our justification as the once for all sacrifice for the sins of the world, end quote. This sacrifice can be neither continued nor repeated <clears throat> nor replaced nor complemented, but rather it can and should become effective ever anew in the midst of the congregation. There are different interpretations among us regarding the nature and extent of this effectiveness. So this is a really, this is a really good statement. I mean, I affirm this completely wholeheartedly. So let's delve into um, what's, what's going on there. So if if you know anything about the debates in the medieval period that lead up to the Reformation uh, regarding the Eucharist, and especially some of Luther's harsher statements, but not just Luther, I mean, you find it in Chemnitz and, and others as well, it's very clear, and you can find this in medieval theology, and I could spend some time delving into this, the, the, the medieval theology of this, including in figures like Aquinas, and I love Aquinas in many ways, but I think Aquinas uh, is is mistaken on a number of issues, and this would be this would certainly be one of them. But it's clear that in the medieval period there is a an idea of Eucharistic sacrifice that's very popular, in which Christ is essentially re-sacrificed on the altar at every mass. That there is a, a an offering, a propitiatory offering on behalf of the priest, particularly. And sometimes they could say that the offering is also of the congregation, but you have this practice of private masses where the priest is just doing it by himself. So, it, it and yeah, it's in the stead of the church, even though they're not there. So there are all sorts of ways of talking about it. But essentially, you in reality, you've got just a priest by himself, um, or with one other person there sometimes, consecrating on and receiving as well on behalf of other people. And the reason that that can happen is because there is this notion of the Eucharist as as sacrifice. It, it is a re-sacrifice of Christ on the altar. And it, it's very clear, at least in some, and, and there's a variety, of, there are a variety of perspectives within the Middle Ages. So this is it's important to say there isn't one like unified medieval perspective on this either. But uh, the, the notion of Eucharist and sacrifice does grow in its its popularity and in its prominence during, during this particular era. Uh, so the 
the, the problem with this, of course, is that simply that Scripture says otherwise. Like, Scripture says that Christ's sacrifice was once for all. So why, what is this notion of, of a kind of re-sacrifice of Christ, this propitiatory offering that the priest is offering every service, where, wherein Scripture is pretty, pretty clearly testifies that Christ died once for all, we now receive the benefits of that sacrifice in our lives, but there is no need for sacrifice today. I mean, the, the idea of a repeated sacrifice is what happened in the Old Covenant. The entire book of Hebrews is basically written to make the argument that we don't need repeated sacrifices because we have the final sacrifice and the fulfillment of all sacrifice in Christ. So it's very clear when you look at the medieval period and some of the things that are being taught that they simply aren't consistent with that once-for-all teaching of, of Holy Scripture. So that's what sets the background for what the Lutheran critique generally is going to be of what's what's happening in Rome. And theoretically, however, in terms of where Rome is at, and we'll see as we read through through a lot of this, there has been a lot of shifting in Rome. So a lot of the, and, and I say this about, about Trent, which kind of seems to surprise people sometimes, but Trent very clearly did listen to and adopt certain elements of the Reformation. So the medieval church pre-Trent and then the, uh, the post-Reformation church after Trent are very, are very different things in a, in a bunch of ways. Uh, one is just that pre-Trent, the church allows for a lot more variability on a number of issues, which just had never been officially decided by the church at all. Uh, but the, the other is that post-Trent, there is an affirmation of the importance and necessity of grace that does, for example, put to put to death within the church these uh, what what Gregory Romini called the Neo Pelagiani, the, the new Pelagians in the church that, that the reformers are so adamantly opposed to. So Trent does adopt some reforms through critiques that have been happening by the reformers and humanists as well. So what you have in the post Tridentine church is there is a much more careful explanation of Eucharist and sacrifice and what the Eucharistic sacrifice is. So you don't have this re-sacrifice kind of language that is uncarefully used in the Middle Ages after the Reformation. Now that doesn't mean that they're willing, at least at Trent, to say to say that they were influenced by the reformers in the in these various ways. But it's pretty clear that they did listen to some of the criticisms, and some of these criticisms were 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 accepted. I mean, this is why we speak about it as the, the counter-reformation, because there is a reformation within Rome. Uh, and some of that is good and some of it is certainly not good, I would say, because a lot of it is a reaction against the Reformation as well and, and what are I, I would see certainly as positive things coming out of the theology of, of Luther and the, the Lutheran Reformation in, in particular. But as we get then into the 20th century, there are, especially through a lot of ecumenical movements, there are debates over the nature of Eucharistic sacrifice within Roman Catholic theology. You know, I, I can't tell you that I know all of the, the nuances of those debates. Oh, what, what I have read is really more dialogues in conversations with Lutherans. There, and this is throughout various dialogues that occurred in the 20th century. So I, I can't tell you the details of the inter-Roman debates over the nature of, of Eucharistic sacrifice. I know they exist, I know some, but you'd have to ask a Roman Catholic to get a more precise definition because I'm not really, that's not really my my area. I, I just want to know as, as a Lutheran, what are what are you communicating to us in these dialogues? So I understand that there's debate within, within Rome and there's debate among Lutherans as well over Eucharist and sacrifice. And we can talk about, we're going to delve into what some of those differences differences are. But through especially the liturgical renewal movement in the early 20th century, and in some ways this is late 19th, but really early 20th century, there is a, a recapturing of very early patristic liturgies, along with an increased study in liturgical practices of ancient Judaism and how those liturgical practices of ancient Judaism then informed early Christian liturgy. 
So with some of that came then a, a lot of development of ideas about exactly how it is that the Eucharist can be called a sacrifice today. So there are a lot of nuances that are added to this conversation, at least among many in Rome through ecumenical dialogues that have made it clear that there are some ways of explaining the propitiatory sacrifice in the mass, which is far more consistent with how how a Lutheran perspective would, would see sacrifice. So there has been a lot of clarification and a lot of very helpful clarification so that the lines between the two positions, uh, I think, probably aren't drawn as strictly as, as they once were. I would say that's because Rome has shifted. Of course, Rome won't say that. They, they won't say that they've shifted because the, uh, that's kind of the whole thing of how Rome sees itself and its consistency within tradition. But but looking from the outside and looking at just the historical documents and reading the ecumenical dialogues today compared to what someone like a Robert Bellarmine even says, and that's post-Trent, but especially pre-Trent, it's clear that there has been a lot of nuance and a lot of shifting that's occurred that really has brought them further in, in our direction than was previously the case. So I, I do think that we tend... A lot of Protestants, especially those who are devoted to the Reformation, whether it's it's Lutheran, Reformed, or uh, Anglican, um, not, not Anglo-Catholics so much, but uh, who, who are really rooted in, in the writings of the Reformers, we tend to want to grab onto the critiques of the Reformers and then kind of continue the same polemical argumentation that the Reformers had. And that's not really fair to where Rome is at today. Now, in a lot of in a lot of places, it is. So it depends on, on the issue. But it's always important to see where is Rome at today. Where are the theologians at today? What are the particular people you're talking about? Because a lot of times, when you're polemicizing in a kind of 16th century context, you're assuming consistency in Rome, and there isn't consistency in Rome. Which is why, you know, I, I don't think that we need to just assume that you know, say a Robert Bellarmine is representative of, of the Roman tradition today. And and that's the very reason I, I don't find the Roman Catholic claims compelling in any way is because, to me, the, the whole argument for why to be a Roman Catholic is the consistency of tradition. And I just don't see that. But I also see that, from my perspective, is in some ways it's been it's been positive. There's been um, the, the shift shifting that's occurred has allowed for dialogue in ways that was just not possible in the immediate uh, post-Reformation church. So we we are Catholics and Lutherans together. We're both affirming, according to this statement, that Jesus Christ is present. He is present. We receive Christ. We receive his body and blood. Um, and this Christ was the, is the same one who was crucified, who died for our sins and rose for our justification. We have the language of the once-for-all sacrifice for the sins of the world. So the once-for-all sacrificial language is adopted by Lutherans and by Roman Catholics. That's exactly what the question is going to be, especially in the medieval formulations of how can you talk about these re-sacrifices when the whole point of the atonement is that it's an end to sacrifice because Christ was the once-for-all um, sacrifice. But So it's acknowledged here by the Roman Catholics in this dialogue um, that the sacrifice of Christ, it, and these, these clarifications are really helpful, it cannot be continued— so it's not a sacrifice that started and keeps going until Christ's return. It cannot be repeated, so it's not a re-sacrifice. It can't be replaced, so there's no new sacrifice that replaces the sacrifice of Christ. Nor complemented. Now that 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 language is really helpful. Nor complemented. We're not even. It's not just that Christ's sacrifice took you know part of our the punishment for our sins or the penalty for our sins, and now we need to complement or add X Y Z onto it. So that that's really helpful. Now, there, the question that I would ask is, is that really consistent with how Rome was in the Reformation polemics? And I don't think it is, but that, but to some extent, I mean, what does that matter to me? Uh, <laughs> it would just bother me if I was Roman Catholic because of the inconsistency of tradition, but what, what does that bother me? Okay. Um, but rather, it can and should become effective ever anew in the midst of the congregation. So this is something that Lutherans affirm as well. This is saying Lutherans in the ILC, we affirm that there is a sense in which the sacrifice of Christ does become uh, effective at that moment that we are celebrating the sacrament of the Eucharist. We receive the body of Christ. We receive um, the, the blood of Christ. So it is, it is something that is renewed in the midst of the congregation. It is daily 
renewed. Now that there are, it, it's acknowledged here that there are differences in terms of how we explain that. But here is a, something that that's helpful that's developed in a lot of the, an understanding of this has developed uh, throughout the 20th century uh, with the study of of Jewish liturgical theology. Now, it, it must be said, you know, when we're talking about the the liturgy of of ancient Judaism, it is very difficult to piece these things together. What the liturgy of Judaism, what the beliefs of Judaism were in the first century. And the reason for that is we don't have a lot of documents from the first century itself, which, you know, outline, here is everything that the Jews believed and were doing. So what we largely have to do is, uh, and when you look at scholars of Judaism trying to piece together uh, what first century Judaism was like, we're largely going 200 years prior to the first century, prior to Christianity, and then up to 200 AD. And we're looking at Judaism before and after Christianity and trying to take pieces together of what we think that picture looked like in, in the first century. So it's important to, to note that because the things that we often and often I hear preached as taken for granted of this is what the Jews at this time were doing, we don't quite know all of those things. And we definitely know that a lot of the... the um, you know, self-definition of Judaism and what Judaism is, post-Christianity is done in response to the rise of Christianity in a lot of ways. So we should expect some shifting on various points. Uh, so what I say, when I say this, when we're talking about Judaism and Jewish liturgies, it's just important to keep that that nuance in mind because we're this is not exact. We're trying to piece pre- and post-Christian things together to say, generally, what does it look like things were like in the first century? Um, but it does appear, when we're looking at the specifically the, the liturgy of the Passover, which is going to be highly influential for um, the Paschal liturgy that in, in the Mass, this is going to be very influential for the development of the, the liturgy of the Lord's Supper within early churches. And of course it's going to be, because a lot of the early Christians come from the Jewish a Jewish background, or are, are even Gentiles who are converts to Judaism. We have the you know proselytes or God fears who are going to bring some of that certainly into um, into how Christians worship as well. So we should expect a lot of of bringing elements of a Jewish a Jewish liturgical practice over into Christianity. Uh, but there's an understanding of the Passover where when the the Jews come together, they come together to remember the Passover and partake of the Passover meal. Now, in, in our context, in our mindset, as uh, modern people, uh, we tend to think of the language of memorial as a historical remembrance. We think, okay, this was a historical event because we have this very linear understanding of history, which is why we we write things in very chronological order, whereas like the gospel writers often don't because they think of history in terms of meaning more than they do in terms of like an exact order of events, which is why the gospels are not really biographies of Jesus, at least in the modern sense. So I know that there are some scholars who are kind of coming around to saying they kind of are biographies of Jesus, but in an ancient sense of biography. Um, but, but they don't think linearly, the ancient world does not think as linearly as we do. So when we think of something like a remembrance, of course, we're going to go to, we are remembering a past event. It's like kind of like a history lesson that you've got. This is like a history lesson about the Passover. So we kind of reenact it to, to show this is what happened to the Passover. But for the ancient Jew, the Passover was far more than that. And there was a sense in which when the Jewish family gathered together, it was a family meal, a family celebration. When they gathered together to celebrate the Passover, it was not that the the Jewish people are just remembering as a historical event what happened to people in the past. Instead, they are becoming part of that. The Passover event is becoming present. In some way, they are actually part of that people. They are becoming part of the same, because they're part of the same people that were there with Moses. So there's an understanding that the past becomes, in a sense, present, that a memorial is more the Passover itself becoming present into us in our lives during the commemoration rather than just a historical commemoration of a past event. So in some way, the past event is becoming present right here. So if, if that 
Jewish liturgical theology lies behind how a lot of Christians then start to speak about the Eucharist and their understanding. And, and if that really was, you know, the Last Supper is clearly given at a Passover meal. This is the new Passover meal. If that's the case, then if sacrifice for a Jew is connected with this this coming together of the, the person in the present moment and that past event of redemption of their people, then the same kind of thing is happening in, in the Eucharist. So we do have this, this same kind of coming together of past and present so that because the body and blood of Christ are for the forgiveness of sins, as Jesus specifically says to his disciples, well, what does it mean that, that I receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, but that that past event is becoming present to me now? And, and this is true about the, the cross in general. That I mean, we understand this from the Old Testament. We're even told that Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. What the heck does that mean? I mean, of course, he wasn't literally crucified before the foundation of the world. Well, but but the point is this this event, though it happens in real history at a particular year and time that you could you could date under Pontius Pilate. We've got that phrase in the the creed that it is a per particular historical event. We're not universalizing it as some general truth outside of space time history or something. Uh, we're not doing the whole Hegel thing, which you don't want to go there. But so I think what's going on with the this idea then of Christ being crucified before the foundation of the world is that this event, though it happens in history, defines all of history. It in some way stands outside of and above history, even though it is within history. So that the so the benefits of the cross of Christ are received prior to the event. This is why anybody in the old covenant could be forgiven, looking forward to that event. And we are, are brought, when we are brought to faith, we're brought into the reality of that event of Christ's sacrifice. This is why I am baptized into Christ's death, right? When I am baptized, that, that past event of the death of Christ becomes present to me now. So if that's, and that's extremely explicit with, with baptism. So if that's the case, of course we can say that that, that would be the case with um, the Eucharist as well. So there is a sense in which the sacrifice of Christ becomes present to us. Because if God really is delivering to me the forgiveness of sins, and he's delivering to me the body of Christ— what is that but the crucified Christ? It's it's the the benefits of the cross are now coming in real time history to me as I am receiving it. So it is becoming present at the moment that the church gathers gathers together. Just as the the sacrifice of Christ, I would say, is in some ways present in our in our baptisms that we are brought into that historical past reality that we are now crucified with Him, as if we were there in the cross incorporated into into him and this the, the language of sacrifice often comes up in in a lot of roman catholic polemics in relation to paul's writing to the corinthians because as, as we're talking about a theology of of the eucharist we and, and we have implications in various texts so i think there are eucharistic references throughout but uh, throughout both the old and new testament we can certainly talk about the typological uh, foundations of the Eucharist with the manna in the wilderness and the Passover. Um, but when we're looking strictly New Testament texts that give us a theology of, of Holy Communion. We've got like the words of institution, and then we've got 1 Corinthians as the most foundational text. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with uh, abuse of the supper. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul does make a parallel between the, the sacrifices of the pagans to pagan gods and Holy Communion. That's often brought up by, by Roman Catholics to say, look, they're both sacrifices because that's how this parallel works. Um, now, I don't think the parallel is actually as strong as, as Roman Catholic polemicists and apologists often make, make the case. But um, e even with that being the case, it, it doesn't prove that there is an exact parallel between the sacrifices of you know the pagan god to the pagan gods, for example, and then and then the Eucharist. So, I'll, and I'll just read the the text here. It's from First Corinthians um, chapter ten, verse fourteen. And really, there there's a lot more context to this. If you want to read the prior chapter as well, if you really want to get into, um, we're actually starting at chapter eight, where you have Paul talking about the the nature of of idols and the question of should we eat meat sacrificed to idols. So he's this is within the context of sacrificial offerings. 
that he that he then um, says this. Okay, in verse 14, he says, Therefore, my beloved, shun the worship of idols. And in particular, he is referencing here the nature of sacrifice. So he's talking about sacrificial worship. In verse 15, I speak as to sensible men. Judge for yourselves when I say, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Um, you know, then, then he goes on, verse 18, Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifice as partners in the altar. What do I imply then, that food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So he does certainly make a parallel. And he's making a parallel between the participatory nature of the offerings to demons so that if you are if you're offering uh, food to idols that are demonic and, and that you partake of that through the partaking of it you are through the eating of it you are participating in those those beings and this is the case with the old testament you participate in the the meals and some of the sacrifices included eating some of them just the priest, but some of them the, the offerer would also engage in eating. And there is a participatory nature of that eating so that as you eat, you are you are kind of taking that sacrifice to yourself. You're becoming a part of that. And so it's, it's in the context of that that this is then paralleled with the participating in the blood of Christ and participating in the body of Christ as we partake of of Holy Communion. So this is the opposite of that. He's saying, if you're sharing in Christ with the, in the Eucharistic meal, we shouldn't be worshiping demons and then sharing in those things. Like we share in Christ. And it's the same kind of participatory language that Paul uses to warn them then against uh, being with prostitutes. He's like, you share in Christ, you participate in Jesus. How can you share then in a prostitute? So the language is very um, participatory here. But the, there is nothing here that clearly refers to the Eucharist as a sacrifice. He's certainly making a, a parallel between the sacrifices to pagan gods and what happens in, in the Eucharist. But I would say that the, the language there is really more than anything else a language of participation, which is exactly what we would say is the connection between the sacrifice of Christ and our reception of it. We are, we're participating, we're receiving his body, we're receiving his blood, and in doing that, we're, we're sharing in his sacrifice, we're receiving the benefits of that sacrifice. So if what you mean by Eucharistic sacrifice is merely that the, the, we become uh, present with Jesus, he becomes present with us, and gives himself to us in such a way that we participate in the blessings or benefits of his death on the cross, then there would be no issue with, with Eucharistic sacrifice at all in that context. All right, so then there are some further statements clarifying this. Um, together, we confess the real and essential presence of Christ's body and blood in the consecrated elements. Okay, so both of us are assuming or, or, or are coming together to say, and we can explain it in different ways. You know, you can use the substance accidents distinction in Rome. We don't use that distinction. We leave, we leave it up to mystery and say somehow, though it's, it's, it's bread and wine, it really is the body and blood of Christ. Whatever it is that I receive in my mouth, that is the body of Christ. Um, and, and we don't see the necessity in using the kinds of distinctions that, the, that, that Aquinas does and, and later thinkers in Rome do. Further, um, and they are given, the elements of the Eucharistic meal are given as distinct sacrificial elements to eat and drink. So it's the sacrificed body and blood of Christ on the cross that we now eat and drink. So there's certainly connection between the elements and sacrifice. The next point, together we have discovered in our respective liturgical traditions common theological elements of memoria, representatio, and applicatio of the salvation event. This also includes a wealth of motifs of sacrificial terminology, sacrificium, oblatio, hostia, sacrifice, offering, in both sacramental and non-sacramental prayer contexts. Okay, so we have this language of representation, memorial, the application of the benefits of, of the sacrifice of Christ that are given here. Next, in the liturgy, the intertwining of divine and human action is expressed. Therefore, both theological reflection and proper presentation of this synergia, synergy, oh no, 
uh, especially in the celebration of the Eucharist, are of central importance and depend on each other, as the theological reflection must be considered in the concrete liturgical action, so the concrete liturgical action must guard the theological thinking from becoming one-sided. So what does this mean? Now, th th this is where I feel like Lutherans hear this and they're like, oh, wait a minute, we don't like cooperation, synergy. That's not, that's not right. Uh, let's look at the explanation of this. When we use the term synergia or synergia, we use it to express the fundamental structure of God's action in the world. It is characterized by God giving his salvation through created means. In this way, God uses men who proclaim his gospel and administer the sacraments. So it, what we're talking about is just in the sense that God works together with humanity. God works through human means. And so God works through the means of grace is really is really what we're saying here. So that if what we're saying is, yes, there is an actual human person that is a pastor that actually has to move his mouth and make the sounds of, you know, the words of institution and move, you know, your arms to uh, hold up the host and those kinds of things. Yes, that is, that is certainly something that actually has to happen. God doesn't just drop it down from heaven like the manna in the wilderness. He is using his, the, the ministers of the church who have been called and installed into the, the office of, of holy ministry to, to partake of that. Um, and then the final point here, Roman Catholics and Lutherans have a common history in emphasizing the central importance of the words of institution for the Eucharist. Uh, and this is this was really key for the Reformation because it is the case that when you look at a lot of medieval liturgies, and Luther's highly critical of this, and rightly so, the, the words of institution are, are said, spoken quietly by the priest, and they're really buried under all of these other rites and ceremonies and prayers. But for Luther, it's the, the words of institution are the most essential thing. In, in the Eucharist, in terms of the, the the liturgy, because that's what Christ commanded us to say, right? This is the, these are the words that Jesus has given us. Uh, the rest of it can shift and change, and we have various traditions, and it can develop in one way or another. But here is the element that Jesus gave us. Jesus gave us His words. These are the words of institution that were given by Christ Himself. We cannot change those. We cannot bury those. And so no matter what we do in our development of our liturgy around Holy Communion, the words of institution have to be the center. This is why Luther uh, argued that we should be chanting the words of institution. I always, I always chant the words of institution but uh, when I'm presiding over, over uh, the Eucharist. But chant these words, sing these words, say them boldly, loudly. This is the reason why Luther started removing some of these elements of of the mass, like the you know the ringing of bells, the you know, and I know some Lutheran churches have brought that back. I don't as as uh, kind of high church, if you want to use that language, as as I am, I'm, I'm not a fan of the bringing back of the ringing of the bells, but that's a other topic. Um, but a lot of the the prayers tended to bury the words of institution. So this has always been really essential to our our liturgical theology of, of the Eucharist is. We need to have the words of Jesus front and center. So the Roman Catholics are saying, yes, the importance of this is good. Um, okay. Uh, Biblical and patristic studies and liturgical theology since the 20th century. So this is what I was talking about with the, the rise of this liturgical of liturgical studies. Um, and, and that's in the broader Christian world. So that's Lutheran, Anglican, Roman Catholic, you know, uh, all orthodox as well in, in different ways. But so this is something that's, that's beyond just one tradition. Um, have emphasized the importance of the Eucharistic prayer and with it of the epiclesis and an, an anamnesis for the Lord's Supper. So there are, and maybe I'll delve into this more as we move on, because I can talk about Eucharistic prayers and we can look at the, the history of them and, and whether we should have them and what they are. Luther rem largely removed the Eucharistic prayers in his liturgy because of the words of institution being buried. But in the 20th century, a lot of Lutherans started reintroducing a lot of those elements, but doing it in a way that is consistent with our theology. So a lot of the, the sacrificial nature of the prayers, particularly the prayers that developed in the medieval period, are, are really opposed to how we view the nature of gift within in the service of Holy Communion. So those have been excised. But if you look, say, at um, the Lutheran Service Book, which is the, 
the hymnal of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, there are five service settings. And if you read the first service setting, um, which, you know, I know some people don't like setting one. Setting three is like the more classic Lutheran one because it's based on the common service. Uh, I tend to use setting one because I like the Eucharistic prayers that are in it. Um, but it has it has more that has Eucharistic prayers and it has a, an anamnesis, which uh, the, the anamnesis is a, a prayer that is basically a a recitation of what they call a five-point anamnesis, a recitation of the, the elements of Christ's death and resurrection, that which is memorialized in the Lord's Supper. Uh, the epiclesis is uh, a prayer for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are the epiclesis w within Lutheran theology is probably a little more a little more debated, and the reasoning for that in epiclesis, the epicletic prayer epiclesis is very early in the church. Um, and this is a prayer for the invocation of the Holy Spirit. The the epiclesis, the reason why it doesn't have a strong presence within, within Lutheran theology is because it's understood that it is the efficacious words of Christ in the words of institution, the words, this is my body, um, this is my blood, the, the words of institution, those are the kind of activating element. <laughs> It's probably not the right phrase to use, but uh, uh, of of the Eucharist, like that's what makes it efficacious is the the words of Christ being proclaimed. So it's the word of God in and and with the elements that make a sacrament, and so it is the words of Christ that make it a sacrament. So the reason why the the epiclesis is not emphasized within a Lutheran liturgical tradition. It's not because the Holy Spirit is not involved in Holy Communion, um, but it's because we are not told that an invocation of the Spirit and the Spirit coming on the elements is what makes it a sacrament. That doesn't mean we shouldn't invoke the Spirit, but there, so there, there is an Eastern theology which sees the epiclesis as really the most central part of, of Holy Communion. It's really through the invocation of the Spirit in prayer that these gifts now become the body and blood of Christ. Whereas we would say, no, scripturally, it's the words of institution. That's what Paul recites in 1 Corinthians. Like, these are the words that you that have been received. This is what Jesus said. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't have ever have a prayer of the invocation of the Holy Spirit, but it shouldn't be done in such a way that we see that as kind of the defining moment, because that's not what Christ delivered to us. Instead, he delivered to, to us um, the words of, of institution. Okay, moving down now. What is important? That's the name of this section here. The intensity of the debate on the sacrifice of the Mass in the 16th century is also an expression of the importance of the celebration of the Eucharist in both the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran churches. So that's the, the point is like, because this was such an intense debate, it shows how important it was. I mean, this is the reason why the Lutheran and Reformed traditions are not one tradition. It really is this notion of, and there, there are many of other, other differences as well, so it's not like it only is here, but this is really where the, the core historical divergence was between Luther and Zwingli was over this issue. So because we saw it as so essential that we wouldn't unite uh, if we had differences on this question, show that we see it as, as vital. And so uh, both Rome and the Lutherans see this as much more central than other than Protestant traditions generally do. And this is why the Reformed tend to say, we just have some differences on communion. It's like not a big deal. Like, it, who cares? Well, why do you care that much that we just have some a little bit of a different emphasis on this or that? Uh, it's really not enough to divide over. Whereas Lutherans say, no, it's enough to divide over. And we look like the mean guys who won't unite with them. But but it's because we do place a higher emphasis on communion. So if we don't have the same ideas of what's going on in communion, it really matters, which I don't think you see in the, in the Reformed world. Okay. So it's an expression of the importance of the celebration of the Eucharist in both the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran churches. The interrelation between theological reflection and liturgical action helps to explain why central points of controversy were especially connected with the doctrine and celebration of the sacrament. Conversely, this connection can lead to a resolution of the fundamental differences related to it by articulating common grounds and commonalities. So here then are the common grounds. Okay, a common 
relecture of the Lutheran confessional writings in the Book of Concord and the decisions of the Council of Trent provides the following insights. The Lutheran Catholic controversies of the 16th century can be explained not least by the fact that a definitive theology of the sacrifice of the mass did not exist at that time. And that's that's really key. That is really key. There is no definitive explanation of what the sacrifice of the mass is, and that's why you have so many really bad takes on it that are just blatantly opposed to what Scripture states. There have been various more more or less successful explanations and attempts uh, with respect to the partly problematic practice in piety. So there, there are various approaches, even post-trend, as we've said. However, the basic theological question was the unresolved relationship between Christ's sacrifice on the cross and the sacrifice of the Mass so that the Eucharistic sacrifice could sometimes be misunderstood as a continuation, repetition, replacement of, or addition to the sacrifice of the cross. And, and that's that's well articulated. That That is key. Those are the main issues. And so these uh, individuals representing Rome are saying it's not that. That's a misunderstanding. Um. Then it goes on, we have developed a new perception of the particularities, needs, and limits of liturgical and dogmatic language. Liturgical language, in the richness of its formulations, must always be theologically responsible according to the doctrine of the church. Okay, that's good. So liturgical language, uh, what we say in our liturgy reflects what we believe. So we shouldn't use language of sacrifice in a way that, that would imply something that is inconsistent with scripture. Uh, then, dogmatic language, in the abstraction of its way of speaking, must not prevent legitimate varieties of liturgical expression. Sure. And we have we have varieties of liturgical expression. That's why, again, Lutheran service book, there is there are five different service settings, <laughs> which do uh, change in, in the communion service. Okay, then we have uh, a list of some commonalities here with relation to the Eucharist between the Lutheran and Roman Catholic parties. Uh, so, systematic theological affirmation. We agree that essential for the Eucharist are the consecration of the elements of bread and wine with the words of institution in the Christian assembly. The Christian assembly is is key here. And that's gonna that's gonna be the major question. Is but do you does Rome really believe that there's a necessity of a, of a Christian assembly? And that's really the one of the key, if not the key, polemical points it, at the time of the Reformation. Is and this is where it all gets down to practice when you have private masses and the withholding of the cup from the laity. I mean, those are going to be the two key differences, I think, in practice. But those practices are a reflection of theological convictions. So that's, if we want to identify what are the differences, really, what are the core differences come down to, we've got to deal with those those two issues. Um, but we're not, we're not quite there yet. Okay, the distribution of these elements, which are the body and blood of Christ, after the consecration, communion, and the proclamation of Christ's death. So then there is, uh, the, oh, this is a citation of the formula here. Christ's command, do this, and I've said this many times, especially as we've talked about the um, people trying to, thinking they can celebrate communion over the internet, um, how this, our confessions pretty clearly, I think, speak speak in a way that wouldn't allow such a thing. Christ's command, do this, must be observed without division and confusion, for it includes the entire action or administration of the sacrament that in a Christian assembly, bread and wine are taken, consecrated, distributed, received, eaten, and drunk, and that thereby the Lord's death is proclaimed as St. Paul presents the entire action of the breaking of the bread or distribution and reception in 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, so that's in our confessions. I, I love that statement. That's one that I cite consistently because I think it's such a wonderful summary. Of, of what we what we emphasize in the supper and what's wrong with say what's wrong with the, with the Eucharistic adoration in a service well we, we also believe that it's Christ and Christ is to be adored so like why not adore Christ in a in that way why not have the Corpus Christi parade and this is the problem because we weren't given the authority to do that we were told what to do with the body of Christ and that is to have to uh, proclaim the words of institution to distribute it and to receive it. Not to have these giant gaps in time between all of those things. It, it's, all, it's all part of the commun community of the church coming together. We do these things together in a Christian assembly. That's going to be the primary issue. And it still is a primary And that, that's the issue with, with this online communion. You cert, there's no way you can have this unbroken thing. 
I mean, this is the same elements that are consecrated by the minister are the ones that are distributed and received. Um, this is why we don't have these, you know, lengthy periods of of reserving the host. You know, the pastor can't consecrate the host, put it in a tabernacle, and then let lay ministers throughout the next three months pick up elements and bring them to people. This this is not a this is not how we see it consistently um, with scripture. Now, the, there's another question, of course, which is can can the minister consecrate the elements, give them to, uh, say, a deacon, and have them bring them to the sick immediately. Is that enough to have an unbroken kind of action? Because you do have that pretty early on in the church. Um, and, and of course, that I think that's a bit different than, it's a bit of a different question than asking the question of, can you have the host just sitting there for weeks for people to take at any time? Because the goal at that point is to have an unbroken action as much as possible. So that's kind of a question that I know people can debate, and I'm not giving an answer to that question. I'm just bringing it up at this point. Okay, uh, then we're going back to statements in the document. Lutherans and Catholics confess together that the Holy Spirit binds himself to the created earthly means determined by God for the application of his grace and mercy to human beings. Thus, the means of grace, word and sacrament, can be called spirit wrought. So, we're, even if we don't, in other words, even if we don't have an, an epiclesis, we're not saying the spirit's not involved. Right? We're not like, the you know, spirit stays over there <laughs> during, during communion. Um, and, and this gets into the question of inseparable operations, which we've been talking about on the program and other places. All right. Uh, next, in the commemorative actual presence of Jesus' work of salvation, we recognize on both sides a biblically and patristically founded, theologically justified way of proclaiming the unity of the sacrifice on the cross and the Eucharistic sacrifice. Okay, so it doesn't define the differences here, but it's saying we're we're all trying to come to the same conclusions. We're we're trying to work with the realities of Eucharistic sacrifice and put it in a way that's that's biblical and is consistent with the confession of the early church. Okay, the terms memoria, anamnesis, zakar do not describe a purely cognitive process of remembrance. This is what I was talking about before. The sense of a nuda commemoratio. So this is the, the kind of naked commemoration. Um, this is the just, it's a, it's a just a remembrance intellectually, nothing else. This is what we're talking about with the notion of memorial being the sacrifices brought present to us now. Nor a purely effective recordatio, but the real representation or representation of salvation history, especially the salvific deeds of Jesus Christ carried out in accordance with Christ's mandate in the Eucharistic celebration of the church. Uh, and and so, you know, I, I just had this discussion in, in seminary class I was, I was teaching um, in our Confessions 2 course. Uh, well, I know one of the students asked, can we use this term representation? Because it, it kind of is correct theologically from a Lutheran perspective. Like we do believe that, that there is a, that, there, there is a sense in which, yeah, that body and blood are presented on the altar and brought to us, and that does bring the past event of the cross into our present now. So there's a sense in which representation is not really a wrong word to use, and if that's what you mean by it, it's it's fine. Of course, the question is, though, how what does Rome really mean by representation? I, I don't think it's a helpful term to use. Uh, I understand in an ecumenical dialogue why you're like, you know, you got to define your terms and say, okay, we, we can understand it. We can affirm it if it's meant in this way. Um, but I think there's a lot of other stuff tied to it in a particularly Roman idea of, of sacrifice that I wouldn't recommend using the language. But there's something inherently wrong with saying that it's a representation of Christ's sacrifice, because it is. It's brought forward to us in time now. Okay, next point. The celebration of the anamnesis of Christ takes place with the conviction that the Lord himself reminds the church here and now of himself through the Holy Spirit and makes the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross, which is the language we use in our liturgy, present and allows it to be distributed. All right, so yeah, the all-availing sacrifice of Christ's body and blood are present here and now uh, for, for the reception. Uh, I want to read these next two points here, and then I know we're getting close to time to, to end here, but I want to get through these first. Okay, the Eucharist is to be celebrated and received in faith. Nevertheless, even if it is not, it is still the Eucharist. Because the substantial presence of Christ's body and blood distributed in, with, and under the bread and wine depends solely on doing what Christ has commanded, faith receives the gift of the Eucharist and does not constitute it. This is key. This is the objectivity of, of Holy Communion. This is what distinguishes us from the Reformed. 
because in a reformed perspective, faith becomes the kind of a activating element. And I, I use that term again, which is not a great term, but take it for what it's worth. Uh, the, the, that's what makes it the sacrament. It is not the body and blood of Christ unless I have faith. So my faith now is the determinative factor as to whether the body and blood is actually there in any sense at all. And, and this is where the Lutherans in Rome and the East were all in agreement that no, it is the work of Christ and the words of Christ and the objective power of, of God through the minister of the church that makes it the sacrament. It is the body and blood of Christ, not by virtue of my faith, though my faith receives the benefits of it. And if I come in in repentance, well, I'm still getting the body and blood of Christ, but as Paul says, I'm sinning against the body and blood of Christ. And then, final point here, before we close, and there's a lot more said here. If the term ex opere operato, by virtue of the work having been done, which is what that Latin phrase means, and there's a whole history of this with Augustine and the Donatist controversy. If that phrase, and there are problematic ways to use that phrase, but there also is some that's that's good, because what Augustine largely meant by is using that phrase is that it's not dependent on the disposition of the minister or the communicant, whether a sacrament is valid or not, which is true. If that phrase serves to express the priority and foundational quality of God's actions in relation to the celebration of the Eucharist, and thereby accentuates the objectivity of the sacramental gift, that I don't constitute it by my faith, the, uh, whether I'm the recipient or presiding over the Eucharist, then the Catholic and Lutheran positions are in agreement with one another. So then we have the implications of ex opera operato, though, beyond that, and that does get into the question of private masses, and I think we see that there is still there is still a difference there. But in that sense, we we could affirm that phrase if that's what's what's meant by it. Uh, I hope you found this this helpful. This is the end of this right now. I do want to delve into this more because I think this is this is just a helpful clarification. Hopefully, Roman Catholic listeners and viewers, who I know I have quite a few, will uh, uh, you know appreciate what I'm saying at least kind of maybe get a clear understanding of the Lutheran approach. Um, I'd love to hear your comments and thoughts, though, as well as those from a Roman Catholic tradition. Uh, what, do, what do you think about this and to documents like this? I would love to hear your thoughts, and you can leave those down below. And I will see you in the next one. Make sure you do like and subscribe here on YouTube and subscribe on your podcast app for the audio. And we'll see you in the next one. God bless.